you'd like to start? This side. Yes. Hi, my name's, Hi, my name's Ellie Kennedy. I work at Restless Development, who are a youth-focused development organisation. Um, it's more of a comment than a question, but I'd just like to get some feedback on this. I think, I mean, looking around the room, I can see three male faces in a room of 50, <laughs> an entirely female panel. I think one thing that we need to think about sensitively in post-2015 is how we bring adolescent boys into this discussion, how we work with adolescent boys to sensitise them on the kinds of issues and the kinds of social norms that are perpetuated. Um, I think we need to avoid only targeting women in our gender approach. I mean, the word gender is there, you know, for a reason. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done around women, but just thinking about how we bring in a male perspective and boys into that debate. Thank you very much, Ellie. And if you could pass it on to, I think there's another question here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tina Berg. I work here at ODI, um, focusing mainly on the post-2015 agenda. Um, I, I'm interested, very interested to hear these um, statements from across the panel on um, the importance of indicators and measurability. And I'd just like to reiterate that point and, and also to make the point that I really think given all, all the analysis and kind of ob observation I've been doing on the post-2015 agenda, that it's important to, to start talking about specific and things and maybe differently to actually talking about social norms, which is very difficult t for people to kind of dissect what that is in practice and really start spelling out and identifying what the levers are and, and specifically the measurable targets and indicators within that. And also, just to reiterate, I think there's quite a crucial window of opportunity now while the open working group's work is still underway um, and before the Secretary General reports next year. And after that, um, the window will close. Um, so, so it's a really crucial time to start mm -hmm. spelling this out in, in concrete detail and to develop a broad coalition of proposals. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gina. Um, yes, question over on the right-hand side. <coughs> Get, wait for the microphone, please, and then say who you are. Hi, I'm Colleen LaFontaine with Present Purpose Network, and I have a question about um, resources and best practices around social change. A lot of what, obviously, this agenda is about is the policy level, but real social change also has to happen in the communities. So are there any resources that you can recommend that community-based organizations can use to affect social norms in their community and the work they're doing? Thank you very much. Let's take those three, and then we'll come for another round. I, I've got some from, on, from online, so I'll um, come to those next. Tanya, would you Boys? like to start? Yes. yes. <laughs> Boys. Okay, here we go. Boys. Um, yes, of course. Of course, boys and men have to be involved and engaged. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about the backlash coming, and I've already had several donors actually of plans saying that they are concerned about our focus on adolescent girls and you know what about the boys and so on and we explain that actually all our programs have a positive impact on communities we work in communities in fact because that's where people live um, but nevertheless I will still um, s you know sort of s stick to our guns in the sense of saying that the situations and circumstances for girls and adolescent girls are so disastrous, you know, life is so dangerous for adolescent girls, whether it's in a refugee camp or, you know, or in the school itself, in areas where they feel that they might have been protected, they're not, um, that you can't simply, you know, you just can't ignore that. The evidence is overwhelming. Now, boys and men, of course, are part of the solution, the global solution. And if you listen to people like Malala, she will never waste a chance, an opportunity, saying that it was her father who promoted the fact that he wanted his daughter to have equal opportunities to her sons. Um, and, you know, that's, there's evidence for that everywhere. So, I mean, we are going to have to be very careful that um, our work to promote the you know, equality of opportunity for girls and women um, doesn't lead us into a sort of a backlash um, that is, um, in a sense, self-defeating. Um, but I think we'd have to sort of... I think you really need to look at the evidence for what's, what's happening and the, the d damaging um, shutting down of opportunities for girls. And it, it does help to explain, perhaps, why we do need this additional focus. 
Thank you. Grace? Whichever one you like to take. <laughs> no, I just wanted to to I agree I agree with the is it Jenna from ODI about the importance of, of data, uh, uh, the importance of data. Uh, that is definitely very critical. Now that uh, you know we are beginning to collect data, I think we need to think critically about the indicators. I do totally agree with that. And uh, I think she raises a flag. I think this is a critical time. We must move very fast and begin consolidating the work we have and present specifics. I, I do think it's very, very important because as we have seen now, you know, because the earlier MDGs were, were generic, and, and countries actually have you know, written good reports that they have attended these MDGs, but the, in reality, the very limited changes in people's lives. So I think we need to move. And Thank you. Any comments on social change in the communities? Uh, social change in the communities, uh, I think she was asking about the resources that are available. Mm. They, are, they, are, they, they, they are at the limited their resources definitely at a community at a community level we have in some of the districts we are working in we have organizations who are engaging in communities through public meetings through engaging what they call the gatekeepers um, and role models and they created all sorts of mentors in in, in the community to try and change um, the social norms the concrete example I have for Uganda is around the gender-based violence uh, community engagement around that, and uh, we could we could share with her what how what is being done in that area. Thank you. Yeah, Lakshmi. Sure. Um, just to to make two quick points. The first one on the the question of of involving boys. Um, many of our members do a lot of work on uh, on bringing together boys and girls and sort of thinking about how education programs need to be structured uh, not only for girls specifically there is as Tanya said a huge need for for specific programs that that help girls um, develop their, their their own skills but also bring together youth groups uh, one example is a, is a member that we have in in India called Jagriti which does some very interesting work bringing together youth groups. Um, on the question about um, are there resources for um, uh, on on community based change, um, so I didn't plant that question, but um, <laughs> but on your on your seats uh, you will find a short policy brief, which um, looks looks at the evaluated programs that are out there at the moment that are uh, looking at how to address child marriage and you'll see that one of the one of the areas in that is really trying to to develop um, changes within the the community as a whole um, there'll be a link this is a, a a pressy of a longer report that was done by icrw that was um, pulling on the um, uh, on evaluated programs that are out there now we have to recognize that because because the whole area of girls empowerment and the area of social norm change because it's not something that historically has had a huge focus yeah. um, it's often quite difficult to find well evaluated programs on that sort of work and obviously the the, the academic work um, and the, the the sorts of activities that um, that Grace has been talking about are, are helping to build up that evidence base, but there there are already some examples of um, of lessons learned, of of um, ways that that different groups have used to create community level change on these issues, but also related issues. Um, there are a number of programs, for instance, on addressing um, FGM, for instance. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to squeeze in a couple of the questions from viewers online. Um, thank you for staying with us. Um, so from Priya Nath at VSO, a question to Professor Grace. Um, how has she assessed the impact of more women in Parliament in Uganda on the discourse and progress of women and girls' equality? Is the representation of women in Parliament effective? And do you think they have actual influence over decision-making and changing social norms? 
And I have another question, which um, maybe it's for, for uh, Caroline and Jessica, which is how can the long-term nature of changing social norms be reflected within a post-2015 framework? So the fact that we've, we've got a framework which is for a certain amount of time, but we know that social norm change um, it can take a, a very long time. How would we know when we're making progress towards it? And that comes in from Amy Parker at Children in Crisis. Thank you for, to Priya and Amy for those. Um, perhaps I could turn to Grace for your question. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, we have about 35% of uh, parliamentarians are women, and um, the way they are selected is every district sends a representative, and it's an affirmative action set. And right now we have um, a multi-party system, so the majority of them definitely belong to the ruling government. Um, and a few of them do stand on uh, uh, what we call open seats. Um, yes, what has been their impact on women and girls? Uh, they have actually tried in, uh, in advancing and supporting and actually even initiating policies um, for empowering girls and women. They have been at the forefront f on the sexual offenses bill which was passed. They have also been very key in the marriage and divorce bill, though it was not passed because they didn't have the numbers, uh, the more men than uh, women there. They have also been very, very um, active on the issues of maternal health, um, making sure that their finances for programs that address maternal health. <coughs> there hasn't been many, many programs until recently when the issue of um, child marriages and pregnancy. Um, politically, you can see that you can, there are a lot of discussions by the women parliamentarians and um, to make sure resources are allocated. However, you know, the, the the changes are also still patchy and minimal on the ground because um, translating these policies and implementing them uh, at the local level has been problematic. And it's sadly also, it, um, the, the women always have to debate between the party allegiance and also the women's, uh, the, the women's constituency. And it when the debates for the marriage and divorce bill became very, very hot, they, many of them actually preferred to be on the side of the, of the, of the norms and that women you know, must be in a certain form. You know, bride wealth is still okay. It gives dignity to girls. So I think there is, there is no framework for them to effectively engage, engage and implement at local level. But there is a voice at na the national level. And I think what is needed is for both government and also the uh, non-government organizations and, partner and uh, development partners uh, to, to support them and support the, the filtering and implementation uh, of many of these policies and programs that touch the core, the core values, the core social norms, what people really think is uh, the practices because you can see a lot of debates on, uh, on early pregnancy, and people are trying to avoid the, the issues of, of, of that lead to, to early pregnancy and also early marriage. So, and the, unfortunately, I think, well, I think it may be good because now the debate has moved on introducing family planning in, at primary level. So you can see still we are evading some of the root causes of some of why some of these things are happening and the lack of agency and voice for these girls to say no and, and, and ensure that they, their bodies are not abused, they are protected and, and so on. So they have a role, but I think there's a bigger context that doesn't uh, enable the effective change that would want to happen. Thank you. Yeah. So one last minute uh, for, your, for your quick thoughts, Caroline, Jessica on um, long, the long-term nature of um, social change and how we can therefore reflect it in measurement. OK, I'm going to let Jessica go last this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I want to um, link that one up with the uh, question on indicators and measurability, which Gina asked. 
Um, because I think one of the issues is that people hear the word social norms and think it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. And we must be very careful about that. Yeah. Um, because at different levels, we can operate in different ways. So I think at the level of finding indicators, we don't have to get very complicated about what social norms are, how they change, all this complexity. Um, in fact, what the SIGI index has done quite nicely is to interrogate a huge amount of global data. So for their database, they have to have something like 70 or 80 countries collecting the same si sort of information, and then they will um, integrate those countries into the index. Um, and they collect quite um, simple data so that they can tell a story. How that story is told is then where it gets more complex. But you can collect data on early marriage, you can collect data on who owns land, you can collect data on physical violence and what they're doing around that is to look at attitudinal data because now a lot of countries collect attitudinal data. Do women say that they deserve to be beaten if they burn the dinner? A lot of women say that. And how does that change over time? Uh, you can collect that data and it does exist and they are doing it and they've looked at masses and masses of data sets in order to find data which is a proxy or um, directly indicative of change. And they are currently now looking at more complicated issues like the care economy. How could they, how could they find data which is probably proxy data, which will show you whether, uh, um, you know, girls basically taking care of children or doing domestic duties is changing over time? So they are they're already doing that. That data does exist. We don't have to overcomplicate this, especially at the MDG level, where it gets more complex is in relation to the community programming type questions. How do social norms change? There we do need to think about things a bit differently and look at the models that, that we're thinking about. So that, that's, that's I think, um, we need to, to take a different approach at different levels to see how, how change happens over the longer term. Um, I'm also going to combine the two questions, if that's okay, because I think they're very interrelated. Um, and that a, a plea and a plug around the, the indicators and targets, because you, you're absolutely right. That now, now is the time that we have to start feeding mm. in specific examples around indicators. Um, and the Gender and Development Network is trying to collect together um, different indicators that different organisations are working on under different theme headings. Um, and if you're not part of the network and if you are doing that work, we'd love to hear from you, because what we're trying to do is put it all together to show that this is possible. Not because we think that that kind of document is actually going to affect what member states, what the governments, do as part of this process, because that will mostly be done at a more technical level, but it will demonstrate, as Carolyn says, that it's possible. And I think probably that's the first thing we need to do, is demonstrate that the art of the, the possible, and also that, that good enough is good enough, and, the, and that this, these data don't, don't have to be perfect. On the, on the long term, because that, that I think that's, that is really important, that the fact that um, real social change takes a lot longer than most donors' political cycles. Actually, the MDGs and the post-2015 framework will probably be a longer cycle than most donors work to. Um, so in a sense, it does actually give us a bit more space than usual. But I think one of the things, again, that we've got to do when we're looking at targets and <coughs> indicators is identify stepping stones. Because donors aren't going to fund projects which go on for as long as change actually take, needs to take. But if we can identify real stepping stones, which are actually transformative, which will lead us to the place that we ultimately want to get to, then <coughs> we can perhaps have short enough cycles for donors to, to cope with, but long enough cy cycles for, for real change to happen. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a very, very rich discussion, and it's ended on an optimistic note, I think. Um, it's, it's uh, I think, a great tribute to the work that Caroline's been leading here in ODI and, 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 and others have been doing on this very technical issue around how do you measure um, and how do you, how do you make the reality of complex change uh, something which is tangible and something which we can get a grip on. Um, uh, President Clinton, I think, said it's the economy stupid, but I think there's a sort of rising sort of idea that it might be the social norms change stupid that actually is getting at the heart of what of, of, of what we're tackling when it comes to leaving no no girl behind, leaving no person behind. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you that for all of those of you who've come into the room on a rainy day, um, hardly a, a, a seat free in in that in this house. And I know that there's more than 100 people online. Um, the uh, the podcast will be available within 48 hours. Um, so we'll have captured this on on film for for everybody who couldn't be here today. Um, and uh, I think also that there are um, PDFs of the PowerPoint presentations will also be available. 
Um, so um, on behalf of everybody here, I'd just like to um, say thank you very much to all of our presenters and to the discussants. <laughs>